thank you so much again for joining us. Um, today on day two, we have three con uh, three topics for discussions in a closed door uh, format. The conversations are not being live streamed, but they are being recorded, so it's not off the record. We just wanted to create the space for a more in-depth and free-flowing conversations between uh, those of you in the room and the speakers who you'll see on stage. Um, the ta panels today are on seabed mining, on digital transformation, and on blue economy and climate action. Uh, to, to kick us off this morning, I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, the first panel, our speakers and the moderator with us on maritime and transitions in maritime security, seabed mining. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Dr. Satrendra Prasad, who's a non-resident senior fellow in the South Asia and Sustainability, Climate and Geopolitics program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Prasad is, the, is also the climate lead for APT Associates based in Australia and is the former ambassador and permanent representative of the Republic of Fiji to the United Nations. Dr. Prasad has been one of the first supporters of this initiative and we are absolutely thrilled to have him this year uh, as part of the Carnegie family. I'll hand the uh, uh, panel over to you, Dr. Prasad, for uh, uh, the conversations. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Darshna, and uh, apologies for the slow start. Uh, our colleague, uh, Ambassador Tito, was uh, slightly uh, delayed in the traffic, but he's making his way uh, slowly, uh, slowly in. Uh, so after yesterday, I, we think uh, this is a, a fantastic uh, uh, start to a second day of a bit uh, deeper dive into some of the issues that were uh, raised about maritime security and across the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And, uh, and, and today we are opening with uh, uh, the question of uh, seabed mining uh, in the context of uh, heightened uh, geopolitical con uh, contestation and competition across the Indo-Pacific region and uh, uh, the economic uh, welcome members that sit up, please. Uh, And, uh, and, and the opportunities that uh, seabed, deep seabed mining offers to many small island states in ways that were technologically uh, simply not possible uh, some decades ago. But nevertheless, uh, it's an issue uh, which is, uh, which is uh, going to raise uh, uh, some questions and uh, uh, some uh, uh, disruptions uh, as well, uh, as well as uh, uh, perhaps heightened uh, insecurity, as, as uh, some writers have said. There's also uh, simply issues of science and environment and sus uh, sustainability that uh, our panelists will reflect on. We have a fantastic uh, 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 set of uh, panelists who will give different perspectives. So without any further delay, I will be in inviting them. But let me first of all uh, introduce our panel to you. Our first uh, speaker this morning will speak for about five minutes, and then I know that he has to walk across uh, uh, to the General Assembly opening, is Ambassador Tevaroru Tito, my very dear friend, permanent representative of uh, Kiribati to uh, UN. Uh, Ambassador Tito was, is the former president of Kiribati, 1994, 1998, and 2002. Ambassador Tito is a member of the, uh, of the was a member of the Parliament of South Tarawa since 1987, and it was during his uh, presidency that Kiribati became a member of the uh, member state of the United Nations, and uh, and now he is its uh, permanent representative. He's a former chair of the Pacific Islands Forum, and during his period uh, when the, the Pacific Island Forum did its first institutional uh, strengthening and refresh, he's a uh, a uh, former student of the University of the South Pacific. I'm exceptionally proud to call myself his uh, uh, university mate. We're university mates, and, uh, and uh, Ambassador Sito, uh, without uh, further ado, you have the floor. You can sit and speak. Uh, up to you. Thank you, yeah. my dear friend, Shazendra. Thank you for that kind introduction. I did not know you were reading a lot about my, me and about my country, but thank you. <laughs> Yes. Well, if you want to ask me, how is Kiribati at this time? And I can tell you that Kiribati is okay. It's a country that, you know, 
it's basically self self reliance. That's the philosophy of our people. Since time immemorial, we're told you got to be strong. You got to be. You got to be. You know. You got to to survive. You got to face the elements. You got to. You know. Life is not easy. Life is tough. So you got to be strong and be able to move forward despite all the challenges. So that's the basic uh, Kiribati culture, <coughs> and especially. For boys, okay, they're out. The women, the girls are there in the home always. They have a lot to do also. While the boys are out. As a young guy, from the age of five up to, say, you know, till I went to school, university more or less, out of here, I was climbing the coconut tree every morning and every afternoon. Why? Because that's livelihood for the family. If you don't climb, then the family will will be will, will be will go will starve. Not 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 enough food, not enough drink, not enough nutrition. The coconut tree, that's all the, the nutrients you want. A to Z. All the vitamins are there, all the minerals are there. I did a bit of science on that because I also study organic chemistry. And so I said this is important. And we encourage young people, you must especially the boys must climb up the tree every morning, every evening. It's not easy. Not only one tree, maybe sometimes ten trees, coconuts, because it depends on the family, it depends on how much they need. When babies run out of the breastfeed, that's the breastfeed also. You, you bring down the toddy. The toddy is the juice of the coconut tree, the juice of the flower of the coconut tree. You drink coconut water, that's different. The water from the coconut tree, that's different. See, I'm talking about the, the juice from the flower of the coconut tree, and not Anyone can do that. You need a skill, and the skill comes from the ancestors. Some of them come from Indonesia, from South India, and you know, all these Asian countries with a lot of coconut. And so that's Kiribati people. They want to be, they want to survive, they want to be tough, they want to win over any challenge. The problems are small in Kiribati, not the big problems you have in, in the big countries. They're small, they're manageable. Problems within the home, problems between families, problems in the village. They're all managed by the system, the tradition and the culture manage all these things. Now, come to the big world, globalization. We are part of the big world. That's a challenge. We begin to ask ourselves, can we survive? Can we manage the challenges of the big world? Our ocean is there always for us. We just go to the ocean and gather food in those days. And they're there still now. But the challenge now, you look for the food, look for the fish, it's not, not there. Because big big fishing vessels come. They come at night, they come close to the land, just scoop everything near the shore. And then you fish the next day, you won't catch anything for the whole day, you see? So what do we do? Hmm? Well, we are, that's why we're in the UN. Because part of the reason why we're there, because after the uh, United Nations declared the ocean uh, 200 miles, right? Easy concept. That was good for us. We became a huge continent. We're a little island, little dots in the water. Now we're a huge ocean continent. How do we manage that? We don't have the capacity. We only have one patrol boat running from here to here. It makes five days. When somebody is, you know, doing illegal fishing here and we want to catch, he's already in Korea by the time we, right? So we need the world to come and help us. We want the, our ocean to remain rich as it was, healthy, rich, and wealthy. But how can we do that? With too many players beyond our control, of course they pay license, and we appreciate. Actually, give us, he's the, he has the largest uh, uh, any, you know, m license of money. Any, you, you look at all the Pacific countries, give us a top. Why? Because the ocean is so big. As big as the United States, like the spread, four hours from one side to the other side by, by jet, 737 Boeing. So it's very big. And so the communication and you know, all the schools, got to have schools in every 33 islands, 22 inhabitants, 11 not yet. We're still thinking what to do with them. Maybe ask people to come and invest there, create resorts, and then we can, you know, good partnership. People work and they, the win win uh, programs. Uh, we have been asking people to come to invest, but then many of them say, sorry, sorry, you're sinking, you're finished. Who say that? The climate change people, well, come on, come on. No, they don't know what they're saying. Sometimes they just uh, theorize. The media know this, and they scare people. 
We say, no, no, we're not, we're not disappearing. We're not the Titanic sinking to the bottom of the ocean. No, but, but unfortunately, the, our former leader enjoy going around telling people, scaring people about it. I want to correct the record now. Please, never say that Kilbis is sinking, is finished. No, tell the people we're there. It's still a paradise that it was created. We're ready to make it even a better paradise. With your support, with the partnership of our friends around the world, we're ready to make it even double, triple paradise, right? You can enjoy it. The islands are still there under the sun. Plenty lagoon, plenty. The corals are still pristine. Okay, they say the corals are dying. And you know, fortunately, our corals, they know the heat. They've been in the heat for thousands of years. You don't think wait, right? So the sun is always strong on the equator, closer to the heavens, you know, bulge out. And so the corals, our corals are resilient. We call them super corals and super reefs. And so we can start planting and, you know, planting more and, and shipping them out to Australia, maybe save the uh, Great Barrier Reef, which is dying the toe. Maybe the corals there, the types of coral well, might be a good way of saving the, the world in some parts of the world where they, the dark <coughs> corals are dying because of the heat and the acidity and whatever. And so, politically, yeah, we're, we're a democratic country. Why? We thank the British. They came with the democracy, rule of law. So, it, it sits nicely on our tradition because our tradition is very, very democratic. Perhaps in the most democratic, I mean, if I may put it that way. Because when we want to make a decision, the whole village come. Everybody, we brought the concho. My name is named after the concho. Tebu Roro means a concho with a sound goes far, right? Tebu, concho, Roro means goes far. So, part of my family's responsibility is to convene the village. So my father, grandfather, it's a line down, right? And that's why maybe they call me Tebu Roro. Because one day I'll be there to guide my village. So everybody must be there. Once you brought the conch everybody is there. From little to big, from old to young, you know, everybody is there. And so we encourage people to come. Election comes here. Yeah, we have no election in the village, you know. You're there forever because that's your position. And you're always, you're always doing something. There is somebody doing this, somebody doing this. The whole, the whole village is divided up. The roles are defined. You don't have to campaign because you already got it, you see? So it's nice. Politics, in the modern politics, yeah, a bit toxic sometimes. And I was in the politics, as mentioned by September, 30 years in politics. Modern politics, as taught by the British, the Australians, the Western world, it's good. But there are a lot of problems in that, I can tell you. But I try to keep the traditional politics in my mind. Doing the right, doing good, right? You're guided by your own self, not your father, not your... You must have something. We call it the spirit of righteousness. There's some say consciousness, conscious. So when the conscience was launched in the UN, it was Kiribati. We launched that because we believe that if you all follow the inner spirit, the good spirit inside will guide you like a GPS. 50 feet from now, turn right. And half a mile, turn left. If we don't do that, the world will be a much better place. Be no fighting in Ukraine. Be no fighting in Sudan. There'll be no fighting anywhere. We'll be living in peace, harmony. We have living in peace and harmony because that's our culture. We're happy people. Okay, so I'm told that my time is up. I hope you got some message. We want to be part of the world. We want to manage the problem with your help. Without your help, no, we're gonna sink, we're gonna finish. We're not going to be there. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, We'll come back to the Q&A where uh, we'll ask uh, your, uh, Kiribati's approach to uh, seabed mining in the up. And uh, so uh, with that, uh, we are especially delighted also to have uh, Elisabetta Meninin. And, uh, she's a expert on the seabed mining. She's a uh, a Fulbright uh, Scholar in Marine Science and Conservation at Duke University, and uh, has uh, been following uh, seabed mining for many, many years, and uh, will give us a, 
a, uh, a scientific and uh, uh, overview. You have about five minutes, and then uh, we will have a couple of uh, question and answers. Uh, Ambassador Sito, you let me know when you need to le uh, leave, and, uh, and then we'll open it to the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, well, let me start thanking everybody and uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm very honored to have the possibility to have a dialogue with the ambassador, uh, with the ambassadors. I, uh, well, I don't have a fascinating story as uh, as uh, Ambassador Tito, but I, <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna give you uh, an overview of seabed mining as uh, uh, an approach as a new industry uh, emerging uh, right now. So seabed mining is an emerging industry that is offshore, happens offshore, and uh, is uh, involving the extraction and the, expo the exploration and extraction of minerals in uh, the ocean floor at depth that uh, can reach 6,000 meters under the surface. The industry is developed uh, and can be developed both within national jurisdiction, the 200 nautical miles, as well as beyond the national jurisdiction in uh, the international seabed, the area. Um, the different resources are main, uh, three main resources. Uh, the polymetallic nodules, uh, the cobalt-rich crust, and uh, the uh, polymetallic sulfide deposit. So the polymetallic nodules are pretty much side, potato size uh, conglomerate of different metals that are found in abyssal plains, on the, which are these vast um, flat areas of sand. Uh, the cobalt-rich uh, ferromanganese crust is found on uh, sea mounds, which are key uh, habitat for uh, and very important in the ocean for primary production, for production as well as for fish aggregation on top. Very important for fishing. And uh, co uh, while the polymetallic sulfide deposits are formed on hydrothermal vents in the ocean ridges, uh, different depth. Um, so each of them uh, contain different elements uh, that are very valuable uh, technologically, especially for the new technologies that would hopefully help us to transition towards a more sustainable future that is free us from uh, fossil fuel energy. However, their extraction raises a lot of concern for uh, since minerals are not renewable, they take uh, thousands of years to form, so they're not renewable in our timeline, uh, and the removal will permanently damage the, uh, per permanently damage the seabed, as well as their habitat and the species, and uh, therefore also will affect the ecosystem services that the ocean provide to us. And uh, so in the, in the international seabed, these uh, resources have been declared as uh, common heritage of humankind, and by the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea, which is the unclosed that sets also the, all the jurisdictions. Um, and the authority that is in charge to uh, manage and protect these resources is the International Civil Authority outside of national jurisdiction. The International Civil Authority is part of, is an agency, independent agency of the United Nations, and uh, it's uh, the responsible, again, for the drafting of uh, the um, laws and the regulations and the guidelines uh, for, for the prospecting, the exploration, and the extraction of these mineral resources in the international uh, seabed. And uh, this mineral, this uh, mining code that is like the adjunct, like the, this, all the regulation together, all, uh, also includes guidelines as well for environmental impact assessment or regional environmental management plan to maintain a balance between, uh, to, mitig to mitigate the damages of this industry. Uh, these, uh, the authority issues exploration contracts uh, outside uh, in the, in two different entities that can be a government agency as well as uh, private companies that are sponsored by member states. And this, uh, right now, we are, uh, negoti they are negotiating the extra exploration uh, regulations at the, their headquarters in Jamaica. Uh, this negotiation include, uh, uh, obviously, also the protection of the different part of the protection of the deep sea, including regional environmental management plans, 
uh, in place before a plan of work can be issued to, for the extraction of the minerals. And uh, the most possible, like the most advanced regional environmental management plan is found in the clarion Clipperton zone right now and is where the uh, extraction of mineral might happen first. Uh, and right now there is a particular case, uh, it's interesting in the last two years there has been like a, an acceleration because in 2021 the Republic of Nauru uh, invo invoked the, what is it called, so called the two years rule. And the two years rule is a provision that uh, is applied in case the Council of the, United, of the International Cyber Authority does not have a full consensus uh, for the adoption of the regulations. And uh, uh, this rule allows a member state to uh, request the adoption of the exploitation regulation within two years, and uh, by allowing for the application of a plan of work for the exploitation of uh, the um, minerals, in, even if the regulations are not ready. So it's a sort of like a legal loophole that uh, has been used recently and mm -hmm. it accelerate a lot the, the negotiation at the International Civil Authority. So at this point of time, uh, um, this two years rule was supposed to, like, yeah, it expired in July 2023, but they still decided to wait in, uh, uh, to implement the plan of work of extraction. However, uh, there, are, there has been some uh, mining testing, uh, and uh, the, one of the issues is that the cumulative, ta cumulative impact of uh, a commercially uh, uh, mining extraction is not yet quantifiable because uh, the tests are too small scale and uh, it's not really understand, like it's very difficult to understand what could be the damage, not only on the seabed, but also on the water, of, on the water column and at regional level of this industry once it starts at commercial scale. And this can affect not only the international waters, but it, will affect, it could affect also the national waters of ocean states, of like small island states in the Pacific or in the rest of the ocean. So it is a striking issue. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll op open up, uh, but let me uh, pose a couple of uh, just reflections and Ambassador Sito, in the interest of time, uh, uh, first to you. Uh, so uh, you, you are right on the, on the front seat, uh, uh, Skiribas, uh, with the extreme interest in proceeding with the uh, seabed mining, and you have made a uh, uh, compelling case that uh, ocean states, small, uh, large ocean states, uh, they look to the sea for resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, yesterday, uh, we had uh, Mr. Mark uh, Brown from Cook Islands, current PIF chair, who also very passionately spoke about, you know, where does Cook Island look to, uh, but to the sea for its livelihood, and that's fish, and that's uh, pearling, and that's uh, uh, now uh, seabed mineral resources. So that's uh, one side, and uh, Kiribati is very much uh, uh, in that. At the other is uh, you've had uh, Elizabeth. Uh, say that there are uh, issues around uh, environmental uh, issues uh, about uh, both within national waters but also of a more uh, in an international way. And then second uh, is that uh, you probably also uh, need some level of uh, consensus within amongst the neighboring states uh, who share waters because there's no, no borders. Uh, so I uh, really wanted to have your views on how you think uh, uh, is there a region-wide approach that the Pacific could take uh, to seabed mining, or is this something that uh, uh, countries should, in the, uh, exercising their sovereign right, uh, should uh, proceed with, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, what are some of the challenges ahead, as you see, as an elder the statesman of the Pacific, if I can call you that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Well, seabed mining is a very new uh, issue for the Caribbean government. They were tempted with the idea that there's some gold there, some wealth there to be utilized. 
she's always uh, this idea of getting more money for the government, getting more money for the people. You know, this thing, money, 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 is driving us mad sometimes. And sometimes we forget the other things. And so I think some years ago, the former government decided to go into it because some people came to our country and say, you know, it'd be nice if you can join us. You can be, you're a sponsoring state. You can be a sponsoring state. So we, we became a sponsoring state because of the encouragement of people who say, if you go and be a sponsor, and then we join up with you, and then well, we'll move forward together. But now I can see that there are more noises coming from the other, especially the science. And thank you for <laughs> coming in our scientists. Blessing to you, and every word is precious to me. You give me a feeling that maybe we should not rush into it. Although we did sign an agreement, the former government did. I wasn't in it. I was in the opposition, you know, this, this thing, ruling party in the opposition. But we heard that they signed. And now that I'm the ambassador here, we have to be in, in, the, in, in Jamaica every now and again. And said, so we see. Of course, one of our neighboring countries, no rules spearheading this, right, as you mentioned. Yeah, involved, you know, sort of, uh, pressing the button where you got to do it within two years. We got to do it. Okay, so I, I think you said July so it should have been completed. Should July this year? The regulations. Yeah. The regulation should be there. Maybe they should start mining. I don't know. But there's a lot of thinking going on in the government. The new government now is in charge for the last five years. But they've been thinking it through. They kind of move forward with what happened. Uh, of what the previous government decided. But now they're thinking now. Or they're thinking, should, how do we do it? Because although we are, we're given the right to mine a particular area, it's given to us as if it was ours, it's an open ocean. It's part of the, you know, the, the Pacific Ocean, somewhere there. Between, in fact, the edge of it is very close to Christmas Island. 200 miles there, and then if the people start you know, mining just outside the 200 mile line, which is our, our Christmas, uh, then we will be concerned. What happened to the, you know, to the environment there? What happened to the, the, the different uh, living uh, organisms there? Do they have a connection with the fishery? Fishery now is very, tuna fishery especially, okay, very important. And now we know our friends, the Japanese, Koreans who come and fish there, the Portuguese, the Americans. We're actually producing a lot of tuna, more than any country. And we're still trying to understand how much tuna do we have at any time. It looks like we have a billion dollar worth of tuna every year. And they're still breeding more and more. And it depends on the conditions, of course. And so fishery to us is important. We don't want to do anything to harm our main thing, which is the tuna fisheries. And so we're thinking. We're thinking that, that that's the answer. We, I think we need to rethink it through again. We may have to delay the process, but we need to talk together. I mean, it's important. We don't have to be selfish, just look at what I want to get and, and forget about my neighbors. I mean, that's not the Pacific way. That's not the Kiribati way. Kiribati way is always thinking about others. It's the we, the we, the we. That's the Pacific way, the Kiribati way. And so we need to do that, I think. I think the more we task our scientists to go in, sometimes we listen too much from scientists from far out, and sometimes we're not, oh, well, they're good scientists there, but. Sometimes we think they may be politicized, they may be politically yes. motivated. I know some. Yes. Ah. <laughs> I know. I study science, so I, and I, I've been watching some, some scientists, uh, you know, being pressured by the politicians. To, to <laughs> I hope it doesn't happen often. But I hope. Yeah. I, <laughs> so, so that's Thanks. my question. That's my Thanks. answer. Today, at Thanks. This Thanks. Good. And to Elizabeth, so uh, on the climate change uh, part. Uh, one of the very strong arguments that is made uh, in favor of uh, proceeding faster with seabed mining is that the uh, rare earths uh, and, the, and the minerals are what uh, we need for, climate, uh, for accelerating climate change. And uh, uh, is, is this uh, the most important driver for you know, current acceleration, or uh, do you think the discussion is more nuanced? I'm, yeah, I think the discussion is more nuanced. I think that uh, for sure the narrative of uh, the that generally uh, has been built around the seabed mining as uh, the new frontier to um, 
save the environment from, uh, from climate change because of the minerals are needed for uh, green technology. It is, uh, um, it is definitely a narrative that is very famous and it's very it, it kind of like, uh, I think it was for pique the interest of, uh, of, global, of the global population. Um, it is true that some of the uh, minerals in the deep sea are of better quality and they probably will provide a better, um, better performance. And uh, we are trying to um, go through and pass, uh, like abandon the fossil fuel and go with the uh, um, cars that are like battery, um, with batteries and etc. with different type of energy. However, like most of the uh, probably the issues with the climate change and the green te like green technology, it more than the batteries for cars uh, that is generally part of the um, justification of uh, of uh, seabed mining, let's say. Uh, the, I think that the biggest issue is going to be uh, energy storage in, uh, on, uh, on, on the shore. So like as uh, for eolic uh, energy or anything that is, uh, will use uh, uh, batteries to um, storage energy and release it to the rest of the population, is prob like that is going to be like probably the issue, the main issue. Mm -hmm. So when uh, they say that, do we need uh, a seabed mining for this? I think that we can move towards a more circular economy and, ch and search and invest in more in different uh, um, alternatives, like uh, recycling uh, the, of the metals from uh, old uh, technology or um, figure it out another way to you to to use uh, to not use uh, the fossil fuels. Um, right now, right now, it's not. We don't have a immediate need of mm -hmm. these minerals. Uh, I'm sure there is a lot of um, geopolitical interest behind uh, the uh, sort of like the the expo the, expo um, the exploitations of mineral mm -hmm. in the deep sea in international waters so will uh, change probably the market level and the way of the different uh, industries and. Um, states in uh, the market of metals, so, so I'm sure that there is uh, uh, there are other reasons be behind uh, um, the interest on seabed mining. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm opening the floor. Uh, please, uh, I don't know about how the technology op operates, uh, but can you identify yourself and pose the question to uh, the right panelists? Yeah. question. Well, we are now in a situation where on one side we hear people say, watch out for China, watch out, be careful, right? And on the other side say, you know, it's okay, China is okay, China is just another good human being like the American, like the British, like. So we're in between. I was in charge of my country. Let me answer it from the context of what I did. So I was there in charge of my country, and I, and I said, I'm a friend of all, an enemy of none, and I want to be, be a friend. Call, call, call me a friend. Now, I'll just give you an example. When I was hosting the, the forum, the Pacific Island Forum in the 2000, 2000 millennium, the Millennium Forum was hosted by us, 
That's where we produce the Biketava declaration, very important. Anyway, so the Chinese uh, ambassador came to me and said, uh, Mr. Tito, please beware when the Taiwanese come, make sure they don't sit on the same level as the, the Chinese foreign minister. They must be one, because Taiwan is a province, so you know that. Oh, yeah, I know that. But then I said to the Chinese ambassador, sorry, my culture says when guests come, I treat them equal kings and queens. No one higher than equal kings and queens, so I'm sorry. The Taiwanese here and Chinese and American and British, all equal. Right? That's what I said to him. Come on, but we did ask that country and that government, they hold, I won't name, and they agree to us because we, maybe the culture allows it. But I tell you, I'm, 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 I'm here for my culture. Culture comes from my ancestors. I don't want my ancestors to be upset and then they do something terrible to me. <laughs> Man, but that's the belief. You know, that's our belief. So when we receive people, we treat them equal. We treat them as, as nicely as we can. No less, no more. And everybody equal. And so that's what I tell the Americans, say, don't worry. We know what we're doing. If they're not good guys, we know what to do with them. If you're good, we know what to do with you. We can leverage this ourselves. Because it's our country, you want to come. We hope you do as the Romans do. You can Rome, you do as the Romans. If you don't, we, will, we won't be unkind to you, but we will remind you that you're in a new country called Kiribati with this culture, strong, rooted in the rocks of tradition. You got to respect. Like we come to your country, we respect, right? And so, yes, we have no problem at all in the Pacific, and so whatever Solomon is doing, we respect the Solomons. You know, we won't be upset and say, why are you doing that? We won't question that. We respect each other, say, you know, independence, only if you like. Like another house here, another house you're organizing itself. Oh, it's different from my organization. I won't go into another house and say, hey, you should do this and not do it my way, right? That's the Pacific way. Okay. So the Pacific way is to allow the different the Pacific Islands to do it their way, trusting that they do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm very sorry we have to uh, close it at, at that. We started late, uh, but I can assure you that uh, this is a start of a, of a conversation. And uh, if you join the dots between yesterday and, and today, we looked at uh, the Indo-Pacific region as a, as a, a region uh, uh, operating in highly uncertain periods, and that uh, the geopolitical contestation, etc., has enhanced the levels of uncertainty. Uh, one of the challenging issues that the whole of the region, both the Indo and the Pacific side, uh, need to come to grips with is, is uh, how does uh, uh, seabed, deep seabed uh, mining uh, fit into one the economic uh, narratives and the uh, economic and livelihood uh, storyline, and two the the sort of uh, uh, broader uh, context of uh, uh, sustainability and. Uh, uh, responsibility to uh, to protect the planet, etc. So both both these will interact uh, in in variety of ways. Carnegie has a woke stream that is thinking about this, and I hope uh, in the next uh, iteration of the Indo-Pacific Islands dialogue, uh, we will be able to look at uh, more pra practical examples of how uh, these ten uh, these things are uh, playing out in the in the real world. And I want to really thank uh, Ambassador Tito for on the opening of the General Assembly, taking time out, and uh, Elizabeth for uh, giving us a, a glimpse of uh, some of the issues that are involved. And thank you all for uh, participating. Naka. Thank you. Thank you.